research design and into your research practices are fundamental steps in achieving continued research excellence. It is my sincere hope that by attending today, you will gain the skills to create a strong EDI statement for your grant applications, which will aid you in successfully securing an NSERC discovery grant and a blueprint for incorporating the benefits of EDI within your lab. Next slide. So I would also like to start with a land acknowledgement um, to begin. So I acknowledge that the University of Windsor sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of the First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. We respect the longstanding relationships with the First Nations people in this place in the Hundred Mile Peninsula and the Straits of, of Detroit. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, the traditional territories of um, other lands that uh, I know that Dr. Willis is joining us from Alberta, and we may have some other people that are joining us from areas outside of Windsor, Essex. So I, I do want to acknowledge those lands. Uh, so next slide. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, firstly, that uh, today we are recording the session so that we can make it available on our ORS website because we do know that there's um, a few conflicts and some people were not able to join us today. Um, the recording will be available on the EDI tab where you'll find additional EDI resources that may support you. Uh, secondly, if you have any questions during the presentation, you may ask them within the chat feature located at the bottom of the presentation screen or by using your hand, um, the raise your hand feature. There will also be a designated question and answer component at the, uh, um, of the presentation at the end of the presentation. Um, given that the presentation though is being recorded, if you do have a question you'd like to ask anonymously, you can send a direct question to our moderator, Kate Rosser Davies who can ask the question to Lisa on your behalf. Uh, lastly, we will be providing a survey following today's event and we'd appreciate any feedback that you can provide us um, so it can help us to serve you better in the future. Uh, so uh, next slide, thank you Riley. So in today's session, Dr. Lisa Willis from the University of Alberta will be discussing writing effective EDI statements that will provide meaningful insights into how to successfully include equity, diversity and inclusion principles and practices within your research and within your NSERC Discovery Grant application. Lisa has given similar highly effective sessions across Canada to many academic audiences who have been benefited from her ability to explain EDI in the context of research and the grant writing process. Today, Lisa will guide you through the um, applying, sorry, today Lisa will guide you through applying EDI literature into your grant applications and will cover topics including the rationale for working with diverse scientific teams, the current numbers for diversity in Canadian STEM, and the controlled studies demonstrating bias in STEM into your application. Lisa will also discuss mechanisms for integrating good EDI principles within the daily lab environment and how to incorporate this information into effective EDI statements. In support of EDI at the University of Windsor, Lisa has suggested the creation of EDI awards to support the grassroots EDI work that's being done at the University of Windsor. In this spirit, I would like to announce two EDI student awards that will be granted to students who have demonstrated strong commitments to supporting EDI throughout the community and the campus and through their involvement with STEM research. Please look for details in your inbox in the coming days uh, for these awards and be sure to nominate any student researchers who you think are deserving of the recognition for their EDI research. And without any further um, ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Lisa Willis to begin her presentation. Lisa? Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I think it's absolutely wonderful that you guys are um, implementing those EDI awards. That is just really, really cool. Uh, that picture was a pre-COVID picture. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else uh, struggled with this, but when COVID hit, uh, the last thing that I wanted to do was worry about a haircut. Um, so I just cut it all off. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so we're gonna talk about writing effective EDI statements today. Uh, and I just wanna start off with what is, I hope, the most boring slide. Uh, in my presentation, but it is also uh, one of the more important slides and it's just to make sure that we're all on the same page with regards to language. Um, it's um, This can be a really touchy topic, a really tough topic for some people to engage with, 
Uh, and I really do want to make sure that people feel comfortable engaging, especially if you have a question that you want to ask. Uh, this is your opportunity to ask that. And uh, if you are asking from a, a place of genuinely trying to learn something, uh, I will not be offended by any question that you ask. So I really hope that this will be a, a safe place where we can have a, a really productive discussion about EDI in the context of writing EDI statements and beyond. So um, maybe I should actually just start by saying that I, I am a fellow scientist. Uh, I am a uh, glycobiologist. I study glycobiology, particularly in the context of the human immune system. Um, and, but a couple of years ago, I recognized some of the issues that um, are still ongoing in Canada and around the world, and I uh, decided to do something about it. So that's sort of where these um, workshops and seminars that I've put together come from, part of my program called Inclusive STEM. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I should also point out um, that I, I identify as female. You can use pronouns she or her. Um, you can also use they if you prefer using they just generally. Uh, I also uh, identify as someone with a disability. I have four autoimmune diseases uh, and one of them leaves me immunocompromised. So that's just to frame things, this is where I'm coming from. This is um, some, where my personal knowledge and my personal stories um, will sort of influence some of the things that I'm talking about. Okay, so back to this slide, the boring slide, proper language in Canada. EDI is equity, diversity, and inclusion. Equity is providing people what they need to succeed. If you think about, uh, it, it, think about it in terms of a race, equity and equality are different things. So equality is treating everyone the same regardless of who they are. It's giving everyone in this context of a race, running a race around a track, giving equality is giving everyone the same size shoe. Equity is giving people what they need to succeed. It is acknowledging that feet, foot sizes differ according to individual and uh, equity is giving people the size shoe that they need to run their best race. Okay, so that's the difference between equity and equality. Equity is what we are aiming for, recognizing that people have different backgrounds, different needs in order to succeed and, and enabling those. Diversity is people who are different and that can be lots of different kinds of, of different age, sex, race. The Canadian government defines, uh, the, defines it as the list that is, is written here, but it just, it means acknowledging that people are different. They have different lived experiences and that is something that we really want to celebrate. And then inclusion. Inclusion is making sure everyone has the opportunity to participate fully. It is not making sure that everyone participates, but that they can do so in a way that is comfortable for them. Um, sex and gender are, um, are, are different things, especially in Canada. So in Canada, sex is your biological attributes. And this is, this is not even clear among those of us who, who do research in this area. Um, but for the purposes of grant applications, sex is your biological attributes, your chromosomes, your hormones, your reproductive organs. It is mostly binary. Most people fit into a male-female category. Um, and it mostly doesn't change throughout the course of a person's life without some kind of intervention. Gender is who you are, who you see yourself to be in the context of society. Uh, gender is fluid, meaning it changes, can change throughout the course of your life, and it is not binary. There is a spectrum. You can decide to be anywhere on that spectrum. You can decide you don't want to be a part of that spectrum. Um, I want to sort of emphasize that EDI is generally refers more to the people that you're working with, the team that you're surrounding yourself with, whereas sex and gender is more about the research that you're doing. Are you actually taking sex and gender into account when you're doing your science? Uh, so it's a little bit important to remember those kinds of things when you're writing an NSERC application. Uh, sex and gender is very much a, a component of the GBA plus um, uh, 
education uh, that is in a CIHR grant. And then lastly, we have racialization or racialized person. This is an updated term from visible minority or person of color. Uh, it recognizes that uh, I perceive you to be unequal. Uh, I racialize you. I perceive you to be unequal because of your uh, skin color in ways that matter. Skin color, for example, because of your race in ways that matter uh, economically, politically, and socially. And in Canada, we have four designated groups. Um, these are also under underrepresented groups. I will show you some data that, demonstrate this, that demonstrates that they are underrepresented in science. So we have women, persons with disabilities, Indigenous peoples, and racialized individuals. In Canada, Indigenous peoples and racialized individuals are separate categories because of our long history with the Indigenous peoples. Um, that's, so they're considered a different category. Uh, in certain grant applications, LGBTQ plus individuals are also considered an underrepresented group or an equity seeking group. The New Frontiers in Research Foundation um, grant um, application does consider LGBTQ plus, but NSERC generally does not. Okay, so what goes into an EDI statement? According to NSERC's merit indicators, there are three things that need to go into your EDI statement. There are uh, the issues, the EDI issues in your department, your institution, and your field. What hiring practices do you employ to recruit diverse trainees? And then how do you support your trainees? So essentially, what are the issues? What have you done? And what are you going to do in the future? And I'm just gonna make sure chat. Okay. Um, so once again, just if you have a question, pop it into chat. Uh, sometimes I can see the chat window on top and sometimes I can't, um, but you can also send a message to Kate um, who can um, flag me down if, if a question needs to be answered right away or um, wait until the end of the presentation. Either is fine. Uh, okay, so you need to do these three things, but really the first thing that I want to address is why do you have to do this? Why should you care? Uh, and there are lots of reasons to care. Uh, there are lots of reasons that we should be doing this. There's obviously moral reasons, uh, but I am not going to show you data on the moral reasons. I'm actually going to show you the economic and productivity arguments um, that, that demonstrate that you are better, we are better scientists when we consider EDI in our programs. Um, so this data is just from McKinsey. It's one of the world's largest management consulting groups. The figure is a little bit old, but the, the data has not changed much since then. And essentially what they did was to take all of the companies on the Fortune 500 list, and then they ranked them according to uh, what percentage of women were on the board of directors. So uh, you were ranked highly if you had a high percentage of women on the board of directors and, and low if you had zero women on the board of directors. And then they compared the top 25, 25th percentile to the bottom um, 25th percentile. And what they measured was financial performance of the company. So likelihood of financial performance above the national industry medium, median. And companies with higher percentage of women on their board of directors financially outperformed companies with lower percentage of women on the board of directors. The same is true for ethnic diversity. Uh, and in fact, companies with a, a higher percentage of ethnic diversity significantly outperformed financially those companies with less diversity. We know that diverse teams focus more on facts they process those facts more carefully and they're more innovative. And I'm just gonna show you one piece of data that demonstrates that. There's actually a huge amount of data, a huge body of literature investigating the phenomenon of equity, diversity, inclusion, really all from the last 10 years or so. 10 years ago, there was, there was no information on this, certainly no well done scientific studies. Uh, there may have been statistics, but in the last 10 years, this has just blown up. And like all 
all fields of science. Some of those studies are well done and some of them are not. Uh, what I have chosen is a couple of studies that just highlight the points that I'm trying to make in a nice figure. But I really want to emphasize that, that there is really a huge body of literature. So in this study, the way that it worked was uh, 700 people put into small groups and asked to complete a variety of tasks, like a video game challenge or an architectural design challenge. And what the uh, researchers wanted to know was what was it that allowed that group to finish that task the fastest? Was it the average member intelligence? It was not. Was it the maximum member intelligence? Again, no. It was actually a combination of factors, uh, which they called the collective intelligence. And what went into the collective intelligence was social perceptiveness, parody and conversational turn-taking, so making sure everyone had an opportunity to voice their opinion, and the proportion of females in the group. In North American society, which is where this study was done, uh, women are trained, generally, to be more socially perceptive, and groups with women in it have, are, are more likely to have everyone participate. So it's not clear in this study if the proportion of females lended anything to the group outside of the social perceptiveness and parody and conversational turn-taking, but that's certainly a part of it. Uh, so again, this is uh, so a nice study that demonstrates that gender diversity is important for team science. And if you think about it um, in the context of, you know, your favorite sports team, if you have a, if you like sports at all, um, the, the hockey team that wins the Stanley Cup is not the one with, you know, the best player. It's the team that works together the best that wins the Stanley Cup. And science is a team endeavor. So uh, this is really something that I think we want to pay attention to. This data was about gender, uh, but there is also uh, uh, quite a few studies looking at race and ethnicity as well. Uh, and these are just two here. This one published in Nature in 2014 and one published in PNAS in 2014. Okay, so, so this is the why. Uh, in addition to the moral reason, and it's fine if you wanna write about the moral reason when you write these, um, but it also makes us better as scientists. And I think that that's really important, especially when we're asking for grant, grant money. Uh, we wanna be doing the best job that we can be doing. Okay. So getting back to, um, these EDI statements. What are the EDI issues in your department, institution, and field? Um, so actually, if you could all bring up the chat window, what I would like to do is just a, a quick, uh, quick little activity where maybe everybody could write what field they're actually in. Um, and that way we can just get it sort of scrolling by um, and, and get a feel for what kind of, what kind of things people are doing. So I see someone asked a question about intersex, whether intersex is a designation in Canada, it absolutely is. And that's why I really emphasize mostly um, intersex is um, I think 0.6% of the population, um, depending, on how you de depending on how you define that, if you're a scientist versus a, a social scientist versus a, a medical practitioner. So that is absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely a part of it. Lots of biology, lots of biochemistry, some research administration, which is great. Education, computer science, engineering. Awesome, that's fantastic. Okay, so what are the issues? In some of these fields, it is really obvious. Um, engineering, for example, is known to have a particular problem with gender, which is why they have um, come out with their 30% by 2030. Um, strategy to try to increase the percentage of women uh, in engineering, but they're not alone uh, and they are, um, yeah, they are not alone. Uh, and again, this is not all about women, but I'm going to show you the data for Canada uh, and I'm going to start with women and then talk about racialized individuals and then Indigenous and people with disabilities. So this is a breakdown uh, of 
students who are taking grade 12 provincial exams in Canada. If you uh, look at biology, there are 25,000 more women than men taking biology 12 provincial exams. There are more women than men taking chemistry 12 provincial exams. Math is about even and physics, there are fewer women than men. This is a bit of an issue when it comes to um, programs like engineering and physics and computer science and math at university, because they frequently require grade 12 physics in order to get admission into those programs. So the high school level is one of the roadblocks for, the, for, for those programs, but it is by no means the only roadblock. What we see is that the attrition rate is higher for women than men at every level up the ladder you go. The longer you stay in academia, the less likely you are to be female in the STEM programs. So this is one cohort of students. The side, the, the length of the bar is how many students and then the percentage of, of women is over here. So 52, and again, this, sorry, this is one cohort of people. So we're looking at the same group of individuals as they would proceed throughout their career. 52% um, of people graduating with high school diplomas are women. Only 41% of people graduating with bachelor's degrees, 37 with master's and 32% with PhDs. And what was shocking to me when I first looked at this data, this data, by the way, comes from NSERC's WISE report. Uh, so this, is a huge report that's available online. There is a lot more data that breaks it down by field, uh, et cetera, lots of, lots of information in that. Uh, so you can, you can download that report and look at it. Um, as another aside, I am very happy to share my slides with people at the, at the end. Uh, if you just wanna email me, I'm happy to send the slides out so you don't have to feel like you have to take a million notes. Okay, so then the, the thing that surprised me most when I first uh, looked at the NSERC report is that these numbers, this, this lower, uh, higher attrition, the longer you stay in STEM, these numbers haven't changed in 20 years. So if you look, I'm just gonna move the, the window out of the way. If you look, uh, 1999, about 38% of uh, people enrolling in the bachelor's degree were women. That was also true in 2014. That hasn't, that hasn't changed. Uh, the same for all of the other uh, degrees. The only one that changed is the doctoral degree. Uh, in the mid nineties, there was an increase in the amount of women being admitted to doctoral programs. And then as you might expect, uh, seven years, I don't know how long it takes to do a degree in your field. My PhD took six years. Six years later, you see that corresponding increase here, but then it hadn't changed between 2007 and 2014. So uh, what we're doing was not working. We have a problem when it comes to uh, women in STEM that is not getting any better. What about racialized students and faculty? Um, I would love to show you that data, but we don't collect it in Canada. Um, there are a couple of universities that are starting to collect that data, but we have no national data. What I can show you is data from the US. This is the percentage of students who intend to major in a STEM field, but don't actually finish their degree in that field. So we want this number to be as low as possible. And it is very low for white students. It is higher for Asian and Latinx students. And then it is 40% 40, 40 of black people who intend to major in STEM fields don't actually finish their degree in that. Uh, and I feel that the numbers for Canada are probably fairly similar. Uh, when you compare numbers between Canada and the US, they generally tend to be quite similar. And then I can show you this data um, from a uh, couple of authors from UBC, from the University of Alberta, and from a couple other places looking at faculty. Um, so five to 17% of faculty at Canadian universities are racialized, despite the fact that 22% of Canadians self-identify as uh, visible minorities or racialized individuals. And five is in smaller locations like Memorial University, 17% is in larger places like UBC and New Toronto. 
What about indigenous peoples? Again, we don't collect that data, which is a problem because we need to know. The University of Saskatchewan collects data for the University of Saskatchewan, and I would argue is probably um, one of the best universities for Indigenous people. They certainly have, I think, one of the highest percentages um, just from talking to people. They, uh, they collect this data and they, I think their first year population uh, of, indigenous, um, of Indigenous students is about 12%. Uh, but if you look at the retention for Indigenous students between first year and second year, this is, this is not a whole degree, just first year to second year, uh, Indigenous students are only 75%, only 75% of them actually make it to their second year, compared to 85% of all first year to second year students. And given that Indigenous students make up more than 10% of that undergrad population, if you actually compared Indigenous students to non-Indigenous students, I think the gap would be even larger. Um, so data we don't have and data we need when it comes to Indigenous students. Uh, some universities may have information about faculty, uh, but that's not generally, that's a, a, an institution to institution thing. And then lastly, persons with disabilities, again, we have no idea. This is information that we need. Um, because we need to be able to address what are the EDI issues in your department, your institution, your field. Um, and so I think it's important that universities, that um, academic organizations like the Canadian Association for Physicists, for example, start figuring out um, ways to collect this data. And there are ways to collect data. Um, there are, you need to do freedom of information uh, and, and things like that to make sure that your survey is being conducted properly and anonymously. Um, but you can absolutely do it for larger organizations. You cannot do it for your group. You are not allowed to ask your group to self-identify and you are not allowed to, um, to, to try to figure out what your group members identify as. Uh, and I'm gonna come back to that at the, at the end of the presentation. Um, you cannot put numbers for your group into your answer grant. Okay, next we have an activity. What hiring practices do you employ to re recruit diverse trainees? This is uh, a job ad, it's a real job ad. Um, I got permission to use it from a colleague uh, and I'm just going to read it briefly. A position is available for a highly motivated and skilled postdoctoral fellow to take a leading role in a project in the chemoenzymatic synthesis of carbohydrate derivatives for therapeutic applications. Position held at Y, X, Y, Z. The successful applicant must have a PhD in synthetic organic chemistry or a closely related discipline, correspondingly excellent theoretical knowledge and practical skills in organic synthesis are required, Candidates with demonstrable experience in pharmaceutical development will be strongly favored. Hopefully they won't be flavored. Uh, you shouldn't be tasting your chemicals. Experience with carbohydrates and carbohydrate active enzymes is highly advantageous. The project will comprise a close collaboration with a team comprising organic chemists, biochemists, microbiologists, and preclinical scientists. As such, excellent oral and written communication skills proven ability to work as part of a team and strong individual research productivity are essential. Here's a list of things that the applicant needs to provide, the closing date, it's available immediately, and then the university's EDI statement. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, get everyone into um, breakout rooms and have a discussion about that job ad. Okay, I have put a link in the chat to uh, that job ad in Google Drive. So you can pull that job ad up to talk about it in your breakout rooms. And then I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. And I'm just gonna give you like six or seven minutes to um, have a discussion amongst your breakout rooms uh, about is there an issue with this job ad? If there is an issue, what is the issue or issues? And how would you fix them? 
how would you make this job ad appealing to everybody? Okay, any questions? All right, so again, six or seven minutes, and then I will bring you back and I will ask, um, ask people to share what it was that they thought was the issue.
Welcome back, everyone. We're just waiting 30 more seconds. People are clearly having active discussions in the breakout rooms. All right, welcome back everyone. Who would like to share? Were there issues with that, um, with that job ad? And if so, what were they? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go first because uh, I might get interrupted by my three-year-old daughter. Uh, shortly. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, so uh, uh, I was with Chitra and uh, Kim and a number of others, so Chitra's going to jump in. Uh, a few things we uh, identified was that um, there could be a good chance that the person uh, from the identified groups that, that we are trying to encourage is unlikely to come from the specific area because of the, the history of, of, of development and who is likely to have developed, like we are we're probably not likely to see many people from First Nations or say with Black ancestry or so forth for this. Um, Chitra also pointed out that uh, very, I think very astutely that um, depending on the list of qualifications, uh, male candidates may see, oh, I meet 50% of this, so I'll apply. And female candidates may say, uh, being maybe a little more comprehensive minded, say, well, I don't meet half of it, so I won't bother applying. So maybe a... Um, sort of like an outcomes based qualification list rather than an input list because just because you have the degree doesn't doesn't mean anything and and maybe something in the ad that speaks to career development because this is a pdf position so it's unlikely a pdf is going to have all these things you know to to that level so recognizing that 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 uh, there is some flexibility or ability to improve or work into those positions so i'll let chitra take up the rest if there's something um no i think you did, you did good edwin Oh, I need a cookie for that, I think so. <laughs> that was send, <laughs> send you an e-cookie. <laughs> um, sorry, that name just disappeared. Ashvin raised a hand. Oh, there it is. Ashvin Ramey re raised a hand. Do you want to unmute and, and talk about this what is, your group is? This is Ashvin. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so in our group, we discussed similar concepts that Edwin just shared with the group, uh, but also some of these like the wording in the document, one of them was in the second paragraph when it says candidates uh, with this type of background are strongly favored. So using the word favored can subconsciously make candidates think that there is favorism in this application, why would I bother applying? And the other thing was excellent written and communication in English specifically, which very quickly disqualifies many people who are not native English speakers, as well as some of the things that are discussed are not really quantified as what is a strong individual research productivity? Do I provide a number for it? What is proven ability to work in a team? What minimum requirement for my English skills should I provide? So those kind of things may have people doubt themselves and not apply or disqualify themselves before they even are considered for the position. Excellent points. Yep. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share what their group came up with? Um, I just wanted to add to Ashina. You know, I was in the same group. I'm sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand. Um, <laughs> Um, I just wanted to add that in the very first paragraph, and we didn't really come up with a good way of how we could get around or what we could do, but, you know, leading role, um, you know, something about just the idea that some of these, the language can be um, shown that tend to be people think of as male traits and that, you know, it, it I, we're not really sure how, how to get around it, but someone just reading the first paragraph, it was very interesting. Elizabeth in our group said, oh, you know, I just read this pack and I thought they meant it was for a male. And it's, it's very difficult to get over there, I guess, those subliminal hints. You read those words, you're like, oh, this must be a male. But we didn't really come up with a good way to do anything about it, though. Yep, that's excellent. And was that Andreas or I saw Andreas had raised a hand. Yeah, yeah, I did. 
Uh, oh. we're, in, we're in group one. First, we didn't think there was anything wrong with it. And then we realized we were all men. Uh, so <laughs> we thought, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, okay, let's put our thinking caps on. But I think one of the, I think Nick brought up uh, the, uh, the same kind of point that we had in leading role in the first paragraph. Um, Hello. One, yeah, one suggestion Hello. was to- Yeah. Hello? Yeah. I think Basil is talking on the phone. Yeah, I think so. Doing fine. Gonna... Yeah. Can we mute him? <laughs> yes, we can. There we go. <laughs> yeah, the power. Um, so highly motivated uh, stuck out as very male. So we thought maybe uh, highly curious or just curious and then take off, uh, take out leading role. Because in the beginning it says leading role and below it says your your team player. So we were kind of confused on what kind of role this was. So just take out leading and leave it at that. That's, that's how far we got. Uh, anyone else in our team, the group one can add anything else that they thought we did talk about. Thanks. So I love that you challenged your gut reaction that you thought, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. And then you thought, okay, why is it that I think that there's nothing wrong with that? Maybe I have a perspective that everybody else doesn't have necessarily. And if you take nothing away from today, um, but that I hope that you would do that frequently in your, in your daily lives, because that is so key that challenging what it is that you're thinking so important. Um, Priscilla raised her hand. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I just want to add actually two different things and uh, they are about my personal experience before being hired at a university. So one of the things is that that last sentence that says all qualified candidates are encouraged to apply however Canadians and permanent residents will be given priority. So I have went through many different um, ads like that and I never applied before I became a permanent resident because I always thought that oh I bet that there will be somebody better than me that is a permanent resident or a Canadian so the, that last sentence will would always discourage me and I understand the reasons that they have to have that sentence in there uh, I Actually, I think I understand the reasons, but uh, that was definitely someone, something that always discouraged me. And, uh, and the other thing, and we are talking about that in our group, so the, 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 the ad is very detailed and very specific about the requirements. I have a very um, um, diverse career path because I changed my career in the middle. So I started as an engineer and then I went down to, to become a teacher. So my master is not in education at all. And then I was trying to apply for positions that were in faculties of education and my PhD was in education, but I always thought that my uh, diverse career path would be a problem because I was neither in a very professional career or in a very academic career. So when, for example, when I applied for the University of Windsor, I, I said, I'm going to apply to see how this is going to turn out. But I, I was not uh, believing that I would be ever able to get the position because I said my, my CV is not in accordance with the requirements from the, the ad. And then I remember that the first question that I was asked in my interview was about, okay, how does your career path could be good for what you would be doing here at the Faculty of Education? And I actually used the diversity in my CV as a, something that would benefit me when teaching. And, uh, and in the end, I was selected. I was really surprised by that because I was not expecting that. So. I guess that the ads won't encourage people from diverse careers and diverse backgrounds to, to yeah. apply because it, it's very specific. Yep, that is, yep, that's excellent. And you've touched on a couple of important points that I'm gonna come back to in a second. Um, yeah, uh, Mitra, do you wanna go ahead? 
Sure, thank you. So uh, I'm from engineering. Um, in our group, we talked, uh, you know, about uh, the issues that um, Afshin and Edwin also pointed out. So I'm not going to repeat that. Um, one other thing is that, um, you know, I, you know, we feel that that uh, EDI's statement there is not actually an EDI statement. It's in very direct contrast with the rest of the advertisement. It's something there that the legal has requested them to put it there. It's not helping. It's actually off-putting to me. As soon as I read this ad, I would never, ever apply for this job because I know that they don't have EDI in mind and they're just trying to cover their bottom and, you know, just uh, to make sure they're good with the legal system. Yes, yes. Um, okay, we've got two more hands raised and then we're going to move on. So, Jeff, do you want to go ahead? Sure, thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave aside the, the, some of the issues because they've already been brought up, but the one that I wanted to mention that hasn't really been brought up yet is things that maybe don't have to do with encouraging uh, women to apply, but maybe people with disabilities or um, as maybe particularly um, in, in Indigenous peoples or peoples from other parts of the world with less, um, less formalized education systems, right? So there's, I think, you know, the, the, the expectation of the PhD is, I think, it's, it's maybe not necessary in a way, right? If you had someone who happened to have less education but could do all this stuff because they've been doing it for 10 years, how is that somehow not adequate, right? So there's some exclusion implied there where, where you're using the education as gatekeeping maybe unnecessarily. Yep. Um, and, and then the other thing is there's nothing in there around, like, there's no offer being made in terms of making it sound like an attractive workplace. Um, so there's nothing around flexible working arrangements, right, or anything like that, right? Like, you know, appointment can be taken up part time over a longer duration of time if desired, or, you know, um, you know, on, you know, in office times, you know, or only a small fraction, whatever, right? Stuff like that. There's, there's nothing to sort of say, oh, you know, if, if you had someone whether they're a man or a woman, doesn't matter, that would say the sole care provider for a small child, right? Then all of a sudden they, this would look completely, you know, inaccessible, right? Yep, exactly. Yep, wonderful. All right, last one, Andreas. I just want to add uh, to, um, so I'm from, uh, originally from Sweden, as many of you know, uh, and one of the things that I've came to notice with innovation, because I work with OC and uh, the equivalent OC is Finova. They came to Toronto, they had a presentation. They have actually what's called a challenge-driven innovation and it kind of relates to EDI because challenge-driven innovation, uh, it, the contrast is that prior, the innovation would be a few men primarily uh, doing all the research and the challenge-driven innovation is a multitude of, of people being involved and kind of prodding and poking the innovation to be more kind of uh, developed, so to speak. And, you know, Sweden being uh, extremely uh, egalitarian and, and more progressive in, in many, many of these questions. Um, the question from us was, uh, does it give better economic outcome? And they said, definitely. And, and there's a lot of uh, outcomes that are accentuated by the the EDI in in research. So I just want to throw that in. Yeah, wonderful. Those those are wonderful. You have all essentially hit the nail on the head. Um, there are there are words in here that are so called hard words like skilled um, that um, women, for example, are less likely to find appealing. Everybody, every scientist that I have ever met, um, almost every human that I have ever met, um, suffers from imposter syndrome, which is this idea that they're not good enough, uh, that they don't belong. Uh, but people from underrepresented groups have that thought process reinforced externally. Uh, their colleagues tell them they're not good enough. They don't see role models when they're coming through their um, program. So they don't know that it's possible for them to succeed in this way. And so people who especially struggle with that, especially underrepresented groups, find this a very difficult thing to apply to. They are, um, there's data that shows that women, um, and 
I am going to catch myself whenever I can do this um, because I'm always struggling between telling you what the data has actually demonstrated and telling you what is probably a phenomenon for most underrepresented groups. So for example, there is data that says that women are less likely to apply to a job ad like this. Does that mean that um, an indigenous person is also less likely to apply? Maybe or maybe not, I don't know. I don't have the data, but I don't wanna make it seem, there's so much data on women. I don't wanna make it seem like that's the only thing that matters, it doesn't. Um, but, but that is why, I, why I'm referring to women. I am referring to data that, that actually demonstrates that. Um, so you've, you've hit the nail on the head. There is no EDI, personal EDI statement in here. Um, all of these things that are required, 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 that's what I was coming back to. Uh, women are less likely to apply to a job ad if they do not fit every single criteria whereas uh, men, men would apply to this job ad even if they didn't have a PhD in synthetic organic chemistry. So I fixed, oops, I fixed this job ad by making just three small changes. One is I took out that hard word skilled and replaced it with creative, which one of you identified was fantastic. And I left the rest of this. Instead of having that long list of things that the candidate must, must, must have or has to demonstrate experience in this and is going to be favored for this, um, I just changed it to a list of, of things. And I asked, I, I broadened this in PhD in chemistry, although um, having, having spoken to you now, maybe even that's a little bit too specific. You know, a PhD in engineering with a little bit of experience in chemistry might might have been fine. I don't know, um, but this does this does necessarily limit uh, or does limit um, the people who might apply. Uh, but then I said experience in at least two of the following areas, and I have the exact same criteria that that person was interested in. Um, I have I have put that the project will involve a close collaboration with a diverse team, highlighting diverse, um, and I have changed excellent communication skills to communicate effectively. Uh, as someone pointed out, people who do not speak English as their first language are, um, and this comes up every time I do this workshop, feel offended by that and are less likely to apply to that, even if their uh, communication skills are excellent. Uh, really, all we need is for effective communication to be able to happen. And so that's what I have changed this to. And then I actually put the EDI statement up here, the, the personal EDI statement for that lab. We value diversity and strive to create an inclusive working environment. Um, and so I've, I've made it important. And what I've said is that candidates will need to demonstrate their ability to work as part of a team, right? Their individual research productivity, so they have actually done something, um, and their commitment to EDI. And I've actually asked them to write uh, a short one-page statement detailing their commitment to EDI. And I actually do this for everybody that I interview, even my undergraduate students. I don't necessarily make them write, but I do talk about EDI in, my, uh, in the interview because I want someone coming to my lab who, who, for whom this matters. Um, and ever since I started doing this, um, I also have a code of conduct on my website, which I'm gonna come back to. Every single person who I have interviewed has been super excited about the fact that they are coming to a lab where they are going to be seen for who they are and that they are going to be able to bring their full selves to the table. That's really what we want. We want an environment where people can bring their full selves, their full creativity, their full range of ideas to the table, because that's when we're going to have the most productive, most exciting science done. Um, and by actually indicating that this is important, um, we are, this job ad is much more likely to get a diverse range of people applying. Okay, so that's just one thing. I just want to show you um, two bits of data that demonstrate the problem that we have right now, um, because I think it's important again to come back to this data uh, and to demonstrate that this is a real issue. So this is the, one of the first studies that I came across that I thought was just spectacularly done. 
what they did was to um, create a CV for someone, a fictitious person, who had just finished an undergrad degree, wanted to go to grad school, but was applying for a research manager position. And they sent this CV to a bunch of faculty in the US and asked the faculty to rate the CV, the, the applicant, based on the perceived competence of the applicant, the hireability of the applicant, and if they were hireable, what was their starting salary, and whether the applicant was worthy of mentoring. Um, and the only difference in the CVs that they sent these faculty was the name at the top. It was either John or Jennifer. And it turns out that Jennifer is less competent. This is ranked on a scale from one to seven. Jennifer is less competent. She was less hireable. And in fact, her starting salary was about 15% less than his. And she was less worthy of mentoring. And what is really, really important to take note of in this study and in many, many subsequent studies is that faculty members' bias was independent of their gender, okay? women discriminate the same as men do maybe not to the same degree there are no good studies that show the degree to which they discriminate but we have biases every single one of us has biases these biases are a product of exposure to pervasive cultural stereotypes um, it's who we talk to it's in the books that we read it's in the music we listen to it's in the movies that we watch there's bias everywhere and we're exposed to this all the time and we internalize it even if we don't think that we're internalizing it. And what's bad is that we act on it. Um, and even if you are part of that underrepresented group, um, you are likely prone to those same biases, especially if you grew up um, in a culture that you know, has the biases that we're talking about, like uh, a bias against women. Um, I am biased against women, especially in executive positions. I know it, it's a knee jerk reaction and by paying attention to it, by knowing that I have it, I can change my behavior. And that's really the key. So faculty members bias is independent of their gender, their scientific discipline. In this case, this study, it was small. It was only 127 people. I'm going to expand on this in a second, their age and their tenure status. So, um, the young generation is not going to save us, right? The numbers for women, at least, have not changed in 20 years. We need to be actively working to change this culture that is contributing to a scenario we, where we are systemically um, uh, discriminating against individuals. This is a great study, um, if you're interested. Sorry, I'm just going to move the participant um, window out of the way. Uh, women with identical publication records are less likely to be hired than men. This was a really cool study um, where they weren't looking at male, female. What they were looking to figure out was whether or not there was an algorithm that they could use that would predict uh, how long it would take for someone to get a faculty position. And, and you can actually write a, a mathematical algorithm that would predict that. And it's everything that you would think would go into it. Number of papers, citations, et cetera. Except that they had to introduce two um, extra variables. One was whether or not that person came from a, a, one of those special schools in the US like Harvard or Stanford. Uh, and two was whether or not that candidate was female. Um, and so this is a really, this is uh, 25,000 unique names in PubMed. So this is about females. What about, what about other um, racial groups? Uh, this was a really cool study that was just published last summer. Same sort of scenario. This is a CV um, uh, for a postdoctoral fellow. And the faculty that received the CV thought that they were evaluating the CV for its formatting when in actual fact, all the CVs were identical, except for the name at the top. And in this study, they did male and female names in addition to white, black, um, Latinx, and Chinese names. Um, and this is the data. So looking at competence here, 
what you can see in, and they, they disaggregated by fields. So this is biology up here and physics down here. They're not all that different, biology and physics, in terms of um, what, what the data looked like. We still have uh, white men being ranked the most competent, but actually Asian men are also ranked quite competent in, the, in STEM fields. Uh, but in every case, almost every case, women um, of the same race were um, considered less competent than, than men. What's really interesting about this study, and it's just maybe something to think about, is that they also asked about likability. And uh, the data is a perfectly inverse. So if you are considered competent, you are also considered not likable and vice versa. And that's really interesting for um, women who, who grew up in North America who are taught to be likable as part of their value system. Um, it's important for us as individuals, not just women, but all of us to think about the fact that um, maybe we perceive that likability as um, being linked to less competence. Something to think about. All right, so uh, I've got another study down here. Um, again, this was a small study. Uh, so this was a larger study that essentially shows the same thing. Um, that white men uh, get responded to have just this incremental advantage. They get responded to more often, more frequently. Um, and this gets at something that I really want to, to draw your attention to, is this, um, this idea of, of privilege, white male privilege. Uh, it is true that white men um, are benefiting. There is this incremental advantage. It's not as if Life is easy for white men, it is not. Uh, but there is this incremental advantage, the small advantage that they have, uh, but they are not the sole people who are responsible for conferring that advantage. We are all part of this problem and we all have the potential to, to play a part, to play a role in its, in its solution. Okay. This study I absolutely love because this talks about how we might actually fix the problem. Um, the uh, tiny changes, small changes can actually make a huge impact. So this study was done in Montana State University where 80% uh, of their STEM faculty are men. And uh, this reflected the national average in the US. In Canada, uh, it's 30% across STEM fields. Uh, across STEM fields, I think it's 30% average. Um, they did 23 faculty searches in one academic year and they um, put those searches into two groups. One was a control group that just had the same uh, anti-discrimination training that everybody gets. And then the second group was the intervention group. And this intervention group only had three things change. One was a short presentation to the search committee about overcoming unintended or implicit biases. Two was arming the search committees with a guidebook on tactics for recruiting diverse candidates, similar to what we just talked about in that job ad. And then three was providing access to a faculty family advocate when the applicant actually came to campus to interview. So that had nothing to do with the selection process. And what the data shows is that women were higher among the shortlisted and phone interviewed candidates in the intervention group, higher among the on-campus finalists, and in the intervention group, they were 6.3 times more likely to offer the job to a woman based on, based on that small intervention. Um, what's interesting though, is that the percent of offers accepted by a woman candidate also increased during that time. Um, so it's possible that the committee behaved differently because of their exposure to this training. It's also possible that that meeting with the faculty family advocate, which demonstrated the institution's commitment to hiring female candidates, in this case female, um, had a massive impact. Um, and so subsequently all of their faculty searches um, have had this intervention group and all of their hiring has been 50% female. 
So again, small, small changes can make a really big difference. I love this study. I think it's awesome. So solutions to bias in hiring. There are, there are lots. We've gone through the, some of them. Uh, don't list mandatory criteria. Have, you know, you need experience in one or more of the following. Don't use excellence or hard wording. Have that EDI statement and require it of candidates. Uh, you want people who are going to buy into your um, shared philosophy that change needs to happen. Um, and then a couple of other things in here. In the interview itself, uh, be flexible in the interviewing dates um, and times. Have applicants interviewed by more than one person. So you are more likely to fall prey to your biases when you're not checking them. And just by having someone sitting next to you, you automatically start checking them. There's really cool uh, studies that have been, done, have been done with juries and their perception of whether or not a defendant is guilty changes based on the composition of their fellow jurors. It's fascinating stuff. Um, have a list of set questions that you ask every candidate. That means, I know it's a pain uh, to, to have that list, but what it means is that every candidate has the opportunity to provide you with the same information. Um, we hire people who look like us and think like us and talk like us because when we have this interview, we have like this, this personal connection to them. We laugh at the same jokes. We think the same thing is funny. Um, so there's, there's a personal connection. You might like that candidate more, the one who looks like you. That doesn't mean they're going to be the best person at their job. So by having that set list of questions, um, you're, you're giving everyone the opportunity to provide you with the same information. And then as we just saw, having a little bit uh, of unconscious bias training before the interview can be massively helpful. Um, Chitra has asked if I would be willing to share the citations of the studies. Yes, I have. Uh, it's not complete, but I do have a document um, that lists all of the studies that I'm referring to and um, a little bit of information on each one. Again, email me. I'm happy to, happy to provide that. Absolutely. I also want to come back to a question um, that somebody messaged me privately about this thought about gender. Um, and so what I said was you get to decide what your gender is. And that is true in some contexts, meaning you can say to your friends and family and colleagues, I would like these pronouns. Um, but it is not necessarily true that, you know, your biology, <laughs> What I want to say is that you have an underlying biology that will influence those that that wanting to use particular pronouns. And so just, you know, any random person saying that they decide they want to be male or female. Um, that is not necessarily true. So I just want to clarify that. I also think it's really interesting this this term gender um, because it's not just about how you see yourself in the context of society, but also how society treats you. So even though you might feel male and um, have male name and have male pronouns, the more female you look, the, um, the different you will be treated in society differently in ways that matter. So for example, um, women, people who look more female are more likely to get um, medical information that is not based on uh, the literature, acceptable literature practices. Whereas people who um, are considered male by the doctor are more likely to get um, uh, diagnosed or prescriptions or treatment, whatever, based on literature. There's also some really cool studies that are being done out of um, Montreal, Montreal, somewhere in Quebec. Um, that show things like gender more than sex actually predicts, better predicts cardiovascular disease, which is some really interesting, um, some really interesting data. This is, it's a, it's a much more complicated term, but I misspoke when I, when I just blanket said that you got to decide. Um, it, I couldn't up and decide I wanted to be male. Uh, there is an underlying biological component to that. Uh, and sex influences gender and gender also influences sex. Okay, how do you support your trainees? 
So the first thing that you need to know in order to support your trainees is what are they actually experiencing? Um, and you can't know what they're experiencing without actually asking that question. You don't necessarily need to ask it of them, um, but you do need to sort of open your mind up to, you know, what is someone who doesn't look like me experiencing? And there are lots and lots of um, movies and essays and books and stuff like that that you can access that will help you understand someone else's experiences. Uh, Twitter has a number of excellent hashtags like black in ivory, black in stem, um, black in neuro, black in immuno, that kind of thing. Um, there are lots of um, hashtags that you can look at to sort of start to understand what people's experiences are. There are lots of women in STEM hashtags that you can look at. It's really on you to educate yourself. Uh, so what does bias and discrimination look like in STEM? Um, again, let's just do a little chat window thing, a little scrolling chat window. Um, why don't you put in um, a few ideas, one idea per line, what does it look like? How does this bias manifest as, a, as an individual on an individual level? So go ahead and type that into chat. Don't be a beard. Not feeling comfortable speaking in a group meeting or discussion. Yep, excellent one. This really comes back to this idea of bringing your full self to the table, not feeling like you can bring your full self to the table. Uh, your input is ignored. Not having role models. Being interrupted in a group meeting discussion. Absolutely. Students not feeling comfortable coming to work with a specific prof. Yep. Apologizing for caring for your children. Yep, that's a big one. Yep. Being misgendered, 100%, yeah. These are great. I'll just give you like another, I don't know, 10 seconds, see if anybody else wants to put something up. Raising an issue, but having your manager do nothing about it. Way to make a person feel like they don't matter. You just got your job because you are female or because you're black or because you're whatever. That is a really, really, really bad one. Um, it's more of a challenge in the US where they have affirmative action. Um, so they actually have, you know, positions set aside if you're black uh, in the US. Canada is starting to get some of these. The University of Calgary, for example, is now now has a certain number of spots in their medical program set aside for black students and I think black and indigenous students, actually. And, um, you know, while I understand why that was done, uh, the colleagues of those people, the people who also got into the program and their friends who didn't get into the program don't necessarily understand why that was done. And that creates a huge number of problems. Um, having to present oneself as serious in dress and manner. These are all excellent. Being addressed as Miss or Mrs. instead of doctor or prof. These are excellent. Yeah. So essentially what I've done here is I've grouped them. These are just my arbitrary groupings into four things. Disrespect, lack of opportunity, lack of acknowledgement, and the double standard. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of these. Again, most of them have a scientific study behind them. Um, but being interrupted uh, in a meeting, and it's easy to address this if you're paying attention, if you notice um, that someone was interrupted. You don't even need to be confrontational. You just say, wait, hold on. Kate hadn't finished talking. Can, can... I just wanted to hear what the rest of what Kate had to say. She had some cool ideas. First name, last name. I was in a, a scientific conference not that long ago, probably two years ago, three years ago, and there was a a two person team presenting, one of whom was male and one was female. And somebody got up and said, nice job, Allison and Dr. Clark. 
Uh, so they called her by her first name and him by the honorific, despite the fact that they have the same education. Um, that happens all the time. Being referred to by your last name is associated with eminence and um, being more deserving of funding, which is really interesting. Disrespect, language, language jokes, music, um, that kind of thing in the work environment. There's all kinds of garbage that goes on there. Uh, being left out of group activities, expectations and stereotypes. This is particularly true for women, um, especially women who grew up in um, North America, in North American culture. Um, women are more likely to have the busy work activities that don't actually advance their career. So in a, in a lab, they're more likely to do all of the ordering, more likely to be organizing things um, like lab meetings. Um, uh, in committees, more likely to have the role that's associated with extra work like secretary and less with eminence like the chair of the meeting. Uh, lack of opportunities. We have lots of data that shows that women are less likely to get invited to speak, um, less likely to be invited to collaborate, uh, have a harder time getting funding awards. The same is true for other underrepresented groups. Um, there's some really nice data in terms of funding on, on Black individuals and how what they choose to study affects their funding. Uh, and, and lots of um, with speaker invitations issues regarding um, uh, communication skills. So if you've got a name that doesn't look um, North or white, essentially, uh, you're less likely to be invited to speak because there's a concern that you won't have excellent English skills. Insider information. So insider information is this information that is not accessible by everyone by just surfing the internet. This is the information about oh, an award that's coming up. Um, like the information that was just presented at the beginning of this, um, at the beginning of this, there's a new EDI award. So students that are plugged in to, um, to you know, faculty who attended this are more likely to get information about this award and are more likely to apply. I mean, the EDI award is a great thing, um, but if you are someone from an underrepresented group who has a harder time actually getting yourself into a lab, then you're also less likely to know about this kind of award, right? So there's things to think about when it comes to insider information. Um, yeah, and then sponsors. A mentor is someone who provides you psychosocial support and a sponsor is somebody who says, you need to apply for this award or calls up a friend at a company and says, I have this amazing trainee, you need to hire this person. That is a sponsor. And again, we have data that shows that women are um, less likely to have access to good sponsors. Lack of acknowledgement. People were talking about this in the chat. This is wonderful. Um, women are less likely to get credit in two person teams for ideas, um, are less likely to um, be to get credit for their ideas in group meetings. I can't count how many times I've been sitting in a meeting and I have come up with an idea and people were like, oh yeah, whatever. And then, you know, five minutes later, a man came up with the exact same idea and they're like, oh wow, Lisa, don't you think that's a great idea? And I'm like, actually, I do. I did five minutes ago too. It happens all the time to virtually every woman that I know. And then reference letters. Um, when you write reference letters, uh, less likely to get acknowledged for their skills, um, more likely to, to have soft words about how they're a team player. Double standard, this is the higher penalty when it comes to speaking up in groups and risk taking. So if you speak up in a group, like lab meeting for example, and nobody hears your idea, or you get shot down because there's a higher penalty if you're wrong, if you're from an underrepresented group, um, you then that leads to you being less likely to want to participate in those groups, less likely to want to speak up in those groups. Uh, and so as a supervisor, you need to be telling people, I really value your input. Um, you know, I want to hear what it is that you say um, and then actively engage with that person, not necessarily putting them on the spot in lab meeting. Um, maybe that's a conversation you need to have outside of lab meeting, but that's something that you can do double standard for family. Um, 
men who are parents are considered respectable. Women who, have, who are parents are considered not serious scientists. Um, and then uh, the last one I'll just mention is executive presence. This is the higher up you go in the um, chain of authority, the more likely um, someone um, is to say bad things about you if you're female or um, hold you to a higher standard if you're female. So thinking about our chairs, our deans, um, are they female? If they do something that doesn't turn out correct, what kind of um, feedback do they get as opposed to if they were male? Um, so how do we how do we deal with that? The key, the number one key, is actually paying attention to it, um, listening for when it happens, and then it's actually really easy to address. It's so easy to address. The first thing that you can do, uh, and one of the most important things that you can do, is talk to your group. Um, discuss. It. So if you don't even want to get into EDI yet, you can start with a discussion of professionalism. Most of our trainees have never had a real job before. Um, they, a lot of them still live at home and they don't know what professional conduct looks like. And the lab should be a professional place. So what is appropriate in terms of gossiping amongst your coworkers? What is appropriate in terms of music and language in the lab? Uh, that discussion of what professionalism looks like is a really easy place to get started. You need to talk about this with your trainees. Have a code of conduct. So a code of conduct is a document that describes your shared vision for what interpersonal interactions look like in the lab. Uh, the, you don't have to write it. I didn't write mine. I told my trainees that I thought we needed one and asked them to put one together and that they did. And then we workshopped it in lab meeting, talked about what our shared values were. And then that document went on my website and we go back to it um, every once a year, whenever we've got a, a big crop of new people in the lab, we go back to that document and revise it. Um, and that document is amazing for the website. Every single person who has, virtually every single person who has contacted me about working in my lab, has been part of an underrepresented group. They have all, without uh, exception, mentioned the code of conduct and how they valued that. And because I valued that, they wanted to work with me. Uh, so something to think about. Um, EDI training. So um, it doesn't matter, even if you've got 100% um, queer racialized women in your group, it doesn't mean that they don't understand this and it doesn't mean that their behaviors are not predicated on these social norms where we discriminate everybody needs education regardless of where they come from and what background they they come from we have to have this conversation so that we all move together to this new understanding of how we can celebrate everyone's differences so there is a lot of literature on edi i've shown you a lot of it once a year, maybe once, twice a year, dedicate one of your EDI groups instead of talking about literature that describes your particular field of expertise, talk about literature that is in the EDI area. Um, break down those papers. That is an excellent segue to then talking about lived experiences um, for your lab mates uh, and having them come to a shared understanding of one another. Also attend EDI seminars and workshops like this one as a group and then have a conversation about it afterwards. Be inclusive with regards to hours, food, activities. I have a gluten allergy and every time the whole lab decides as a lab that they're going to go somewhere that has zero gluten free options, I feel left out. I feel like I don't matter to the group. Uh, and that's just not okay. I mean, if you want to do that as one or two people after hours, maybe that's a different story. But for a lab lunch, you need to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to participate. Um, provide helpful feedback, use good hiring practices. We talked about that. Be intentional about lab duties. Um, women are really bad for volunteering for these things. Um, and so sometimes you have to say, yeah, thank you. You're amazing. Thank you for organizing my, um, my chemical inventory. Uh, that's great, 
now I would like somebody else to maintain that chemical inventory. This is now your job, you know, this is someone else's job to maintain that chemical inventory. And then in the workplace, um, and these are, you know, if there are trainees on this, I forgot to do my poll right at the beginning to find out um, who I was talking to. I apologize for that. But if there are trainees here, um, there are a lot of these things that you can do in your department and faculty as well, initiatives that you can lead that you can then write about. So, um, for example, a family room. Um, at the University of Alberta, 25% of our graduate students are parents. Postdocs is probably higher and certainly faculty, uh, there are a lot of faculty, especially young faculty who have young children. Um, so having a family room, a room where someone, a new parent can go to, to pump um, if they're breastfeeding, where um, uh, a caregiver at home can bring the child in, the newborn in for, you know, an hour over lunchtime so that new family can spend time together. Maybe there are a couple of toys for the two or three year old just something that shows that your department or your faculty values parents. It normalizes being a parent. Uh, give awards for EDI, which you guys are doing. It's amazing. Uh, promotion and tenure, changing the impact of student teaching evaluations, which are known to be biased. Requiring EDI statements in your annual report. We have to do it for NSERC anyway. Um, so what are, what are you doing in your annual report? Actually valuing the service. Um, that people from underrepresented groups do. Um, female leadership opportunity, not, I shouldn't say female leadership opportunities. I want to change that to leadership opportunities for people from underrepresented groups, um, not just women, but all underrepresented groups. Um, they are less likely to be in management. What I would love to see and what we're thinking about starting at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Science is a leadership group with um, people who are from underrepresented groups, faculty, who are interested in getting into um, leadership roles uh, in the next, you know, three or four or five years, starting leadership groups where they can talk to one another and, and learn about effective ways of doing that. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking there. So, what goes into an EDI statement? What are the issues in your department institution field? I've told you what they are for Canada. Um, now what you need to do is to find out what they are for your department institution field. Um, some of that information is gonna be available, some of it's not. And so you're just gonna to have to do the best that you can. Um, most, of, most of STEM has an issue. Uh, what hiring practices do you employ to recruit diverse talent? We've talked about that. And then how do you support your trainees? All trainees. The number one thing is that all trainees need education and all trainees need um, the opportunity to be their full selves. And whatever that you can do to allow them to be comfortable, uh, be their full selves in your lab, that is an excellent thing to do. So again, what are the issues? What have you done in the past and what are you going to do in the future? So just the final slide, do's and don'ts. Do read the instructions because the different grant applications are different. Um, I keep looking up and away at my other webcam, but I'm using this webcam today. <laughs> uh, so do read the instructions, discuss impact, um, it, especially for the NFRF grants. Uh, what is it what is the expected outcome or what has the outcome been for those particular actions so for me having the edi statement has meant that uh, i get a lot more diversity in terms of the people who are applying to work with me and make it personal there is no gold standard the same way that there is no gold standard for your actual research proposal um, there's no you know check check this person said what they needed to say this is a personal statement about your training plan. What are you going to do? Do not assume that women and racialized individuals are the only diversity. Um, indigenous people and people with disabilities also. Do not conflate sex and gender. Um, that happens a lot, especially in, there's more in the CIHR. Um, if you want to talk about sex and gender in terms, if you want to talk about diversity in terms of your research proposal, um, 
you can also do you can you can use the fact that you've incorporated diversity into your proposal to emphasize the fact that you're thinking about this in your training plan if you want to but again that has to be done um, has to be done with a little bit of care um, do not put statistics for your group again you can't ask also at, i uh, i should have mentioned earlier um, but you also really don't want to to focus on uh, immigrants and international students. Um, it, it, not, not so much immigrants, but international students. Um, be, remember, so a lot of people are using international students as a proxy for diversity. And while they do bring a diversity of ideas, uh, they are not, by virtue of being an international student, a member of that one of those underrepresented groups, right? So people from white, um, able-bodied in, uh, individuals from the UK can be, uh, can be international students. And we've got homegrown Canadians who um, look Chinese and have Chinese names who are uh, not international students but are experiencing discrimination. Um, so, so do not focus on international students as a group. They're not one of the designated groups in Canada. Do not say you will follow your university's policies. If university's policies worked, we would not be having this conversation. Do not say everything is already fine within your group. It is not fine within your group. Everybody needs education at minimum. And do not, when you're talking about EDI statements, focus solely on the research. Um, this is about people. And what are you doing for the people in your lab? Um, I have a, a question here about not putting statistics for your group. Can you explain further? Yeah, so you can't actually put the statistics for your group because you cannot ask your group to self identify. It's a privacy matter. And you also cannot um, try to guess what your group is. Um, you can say that we have um, had lots of both male and female trainees, but it's not about the numbers for your group. It's about acknowledging the problem in your institution, field, and department, and about saying how you are going to help train your group to, to be better um, in terms of supporting them and providing them the education that they need. And also, you know, you, if you're already doing things that are recruiting diverse candidates, then write that down. That's great. Um, I have a comment here that says, unfortunately, NSERC said that the EDI statements were not being used in Discovery Grant as a gatekeeper. Someone who didn't have an EDI or a lousy EDI were not penalized. Um, so that is the way it used to be. Um, but the last round, the, the, I guess last, last February, February was the last um, round, it was actually required. Um, and it is in the merit indicator grid. And the comments that I got from um, the people who are there say that it, it was valued. Um, and it was very obvious who had written a good EDI statement and, and who had not. And it's really about demonstrating that you care enough to put some effort into it. Um, okay, that's, that's the end of my presentation. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. There is a link down here to my um, website. If you want to have a look at my code of conduct, um, you can steal it. It's fine with me. Um, but again, workshop that. That's a, that's a jumping off point for a discussion with your group. Okay, because I'm tired of listening to myself speak before I look at the Zoom chat questions. Maybe um, Dr. W. L. McGarvey raised their hand. Would you like to go ahead and, and ask a question? Sure, yeah, it's Wagir Maragi from Engineering. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Lisa Willis, uh, for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I, uh, and, and the do's and don't list is helpful, but I was also hoping to see some examples of good practices, good EDI statements uh, uh, to address, to put in the research, uh, to learn from it. 
uh, uh, do you have a link to a website or do you have a, uh, some reference or uh, where we can learn more about uh, good practices, uh, what to put in? Um, so there is the, there's no Canadian version of a good EDI statement yet. The University of California has a couple of uh, examples of what could go into an EDI statement. Um, it's, it's, this, it's essentially the same thing as writing your training plan, only now you're incorporating EDI into your training plan. Um, so I'm sure that there are going to be some examples that pop up. Um, I have also written a review that is currently being reviewed that has um, some good best practices in it. Um, and I'm happy to send you an advanced copy of that if you're interested. Um, again, just email me. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you very much. And um, I'm not applying for a discovery grant uh, this year, but I will soon be applying for other types of answer grants. Do they all require an EDI statement? And is there enough detail or, uh, you know, what the length of the statement is and what it should address? Or uh, are there enough instructions that are provided by tri Council in this regard? Uh, it depends. It depends on the application. I don't think Alliance grants have the EDI statement yet, um, but I can't be 100% certain with that. Oh, someone has said this year will be the second year where it's required in the HQP section for the discovery as well. It is required in any NSERC Alliance grant. Um, yes, also the, the instructions regarding how long it should be are pretty clear. Um, in the case of the NSERC discovery, uh, we were given extra space in which to incorporate this. And if you look at the merit grid of the discovery grant, it shows you exactly the information, what what information constitutes a poor EDI statement, a good EDI statement, and an exceptional EDI statement. Uh, so that information is there. Uh, the NFRF website has a lot of information about EDI statements. Their EDI statement is four pages long, and they have uh, four questions that you have to answer. Um, that is a very useful resource to find out information about what should go into a statement. Thank you very much, and I will be emailing you. Thank you. All right, nobody else has their hand up, so I can look at the chat. Uh, would it be fair to say that it's just as, or maybe even more important, that trainees become people who are EDI aware and will be equitable in their own hiring in the future than that a PI's group itself is diverse, assuming that efforts are being made to be inclusive in job advertising? Yes and no. I mean, I think it's important that, it's important that, um, that everyone is getting this education. And I think, I think it is um, lazy to expect that the younger generation is going to change things when the fact of the matter is that we could do so many things right now that would make a colossal difference. Um, if we continue as we are, uh, what we see is that people are having um, people from underrepresented groups are having bad experiences in their um, post-secondary education and it's causing them to leave. They don't, they don't want to stay in science. And that's, that's a major issue. We're weeding out the creative, diverse, exciting individuals that we, we actually want. Um, the people that I want to work with are not staying in science. And so, um, Yes, just as important to um, be training people in, in EDI awareness, absolutely, but also not less important to be, um, to be changing things at all levels right now, because there's nothing to stop us from doing that. Um, I recall from a previous EDI discussion that using percentages for your research group was acceptable since that would not specify absolute numbers. Is this not advisable then given what Dr. Willis just said? Uh, at least for the NFRF, it explicitly says you cannot use numbers 
And I'm pretty sure that the NSERC does as well. Um, again, because you can't ask. Um, you're not allowed to ask and you're not allowed to guess. Um, so no, no numbers and I don't think percentages make it, um, make it that much better. Um, but I could be wrong. Yes, it is also clearly outlined in the Alliance. Oh yes, a few spots where EDI is required. Oh, and Nicole has put a link to the NFRF um, site with best practices. Thank you very much, Nicole, that's excellent. Um, Nick Eves has uh, their hand up. Would you like to unmute and ask a question? Oh, thanks. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. It gave me a lot of stuff to consider. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to grapple with is that so as scientists, we always tend to be, how shall I say, results or goal-oriented. We do X, Y, or Z, and we want to see a result. From what I'm understanding from when you're now beyond the why we should be doing EDI, let's say NSERC wants to evaluate how well we're doing in EDI. It, it sounds like that that's the wrong question in that we shouldn't really be looking at the outcomes, maybe in the long, long term, over a long period of time, we can look at outcomes. But it, it just seems like a case where we're expected to more so detail our approach is maybe the more important part rather than the exact outcome. Would that be a fair statement that more so it's about your approach? Because in the end, you don't know, are you going to hire, you know, all male? Maybe. Um, <laughs> are you going to get some that are this, some that are that? Hopefully, but you can't really, if you're expecting a range in the beginning, you're kind of defeating the whole purpose. Is that a fair yeah. statement? Yeah. And, and, you know, within your group, you can't measure. So uh, you're absolutely right. We do need metrics um, to be able to know whether or not we're doing a good job. And it's very hard as an individual PI to get those metrics. It's much easier as a department and a faculty to get those kind of metrics. And we need those, right? We need to know how things are going in our, in our departments to be able to answer um, the, the NSERC questions. Um, and just like there was a big change in PhD, female PhDs around the turn of the century, you know, hopefully in five years, um, even 10 years, we'll see a bigger difference now. It doesn't help you with your NSERC grant. But again, I think that's why the NSERC grant was structured the way it was, um, because people who are new to the EDI game and maybe have all white men in their lab need to be able to do just as well as people who are doing, you know, doing a great job at this and are planning to continue to do a great job at this. Um, so, so I think that, I think it was actually well done. I know that scientists struggle because we want numbers, uh, but, but I think it's, it's important that we didn't do that. All right. Thanks a bunch. Yeah. Um, Jill, would you like to ask a question? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I have a question from a different perspective. I've had many discussions from students after they've graduated and have gone into industry and they express the frustration of experiencing being disenfranchised and not listened to. And do you have any resources that you could uh, provide that I could that I could have to to give to the students about how they can manage dealing with this? Because we we have some very interesting discussions, and you know I, I I try to help when I can and where I can. But you've shown us the problem very very clearly. Obviously, when you identify a problem, then you can manage the problem. And we have goals within the research environment, but what about some of our graduates that are free range for the lack of a better term, right? How can we help them? Because we can control our environment, but if there are some studies or some tools or some resources that, that we can share, I, I would be very happy to, uh, to use them. Yep. There was a great study that was done actually by um, uh, a number of global companies like Pfizer and Microsoft. Um, they, they put their resources together to, to perform a project called the Hidden Brain Drain. 
And what they did was to ask the question, okay, we have 50% um, of our, um, our junior employees are women, but they all say that they want to leave um, within the next year, the company within the next year. And they wanted to know why, because they, uh, uh, industry acknowledges the importance of diversity, all kinds of diversity. Um, and, and they weren't getting that in their senior, in their senior staff. And so they asked the question of why they actually did a huge survey to ask people why. And the top four reasons were hostile macho cultures, uh, isolation and isolation is huge. This feeling that you are alone, that uh, you're the only one experiencing these things. Um, that is a huge reason why people leave, uh, people from underrepresented groups leave. And that is so easy to combat. You form, form groups, form groups of like-minded people who are experiencing similar things um, so that you can talk about what it is that's happening. As soon as you stop feeling isolated, you're more likely to stay in that particular position. There was also difficulty with executive presence. This was, um, you know, the question of what are you wearing, uh, especially as a woman, what are you wearing? Um, and as you work your way up the ladder, what is the expectation for how you will behave? And there's really no good way for a senior female leader to behave. Um, and then the last, I don't even remember what the last one was. Um, but they made changes within their organizations, which substantially decreased the percentage of women who wanted to leave um, when they checked six years later. So there are lots of things that the organization can do. And I don't, this depends partly on, on your graduates experiences within that organization and whether that organization is open to um, more education, uh, more learning about these kinds of things. Most industry seems to be much more on the ball with this than academia does because it really helps their bottom line. So um, giving them, you know, the information that I have about um, the McKinsey report or the hidden brain drain report and um, providing that to management and saying we need to do something as as a group to learn about what people's lived experiences are so um, yeah to summarize one find a group of like-minded people who will make you feel less alone Two, see if your company is open to more education um, and and more conversations about what people's lived experiences are um, and, and I really think you need to arm yourself with information, um, and by, you know, having a look at the, the references that I pulled up here, um, and engaging in, um, you know, maybe an EDI book club or journal club so that you become an expert in talking about these kinds of things that might also help, um, attending sessions like, like this is really really good for helping people realize that it's not them um, people from underrepresented groups it's not them it's the system that we all participate in um, that is causing it that really helps people from underrepresented groups feel like um, maybe they can continue a little longer there was also this fabulous study that was done that looked at incoming undergraduate students they look at ten thousand incoming undergraduate students. And what they did was have a senior undergraduate student send a letter to the incoming undergrads saying, I'm from an underrepresented group. These were my experiences. This is what, you know, might help you um, feel better about uh, your program. This is how I might navigate your program. Here are the resources that you might want to reach out to you if might want to reach out to if you're struggling. Um, and the students who received that letter were 30% more likely to finish their degree. And that was the only difference. And it was a huge study. So that coming back to this thing of isolation, I really feel like um, uh, that that is a key. And so maybe one of the things that, you know, these graduates can do is actually 
be that role model for a younger or a, a newer um, employee in that same company. Um, that, that proactive feeling of doing something, creating a, a network of alliances, that might also help. Okay, um, Andreas has a question. Uh, no, more of a statement actually. I, I find we often talk about the one side of our EDI, which is uh, a representation from and um, uh, equity from all uh, from a diverse field of, of of people that we all are. Uh, but I also think the the end goal here is 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 twofold. It's humanitarian in, in one way, yeah, but also uh, in productivity, uh, as we need to be comparative on the on the global market in innovation in research and and technologies we need to we need to be uh, completely diverse because that's the way we're going to maximize our outcome for the research so i think that's a that's the that's my main goal uh, you know being in the field i am that's the uh, you know by utilizing everyone uh, we can get a lot more done and it, it will be a much brighter future yeah it's not about hiring people who are less excellent. It's about acknowledging excellence that you didn't see, or yeah. maybe you didn't think was excellent. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kate, go ahead. Hi, Lisa. Just wanted to add a question that popped up previously in the Q&A that I didn't want to get overlooked um, from Yufeng Tong. Um, this came up when we were discussing the um, the job ad that you had uh, had us in the breakout rooms for. Um, you think wanted to know um, so as an employer, when someone applies who's not qualified, how um, how can one politely decline um, the applicant? So I think honesty is really important. Um, I think one of the things that you want to do um, is as an as a someone who's hiring is to set a minimum bar anyone above you know anyone above this bar is going to be able to do the job that i'm asking them to do with no problems um and then paying attention to things like um, edi when constructing your group from that point on if somebody is not qualified for the position um for whatever reason uh, and you've actually made sure that they're not qualified and not just that they're not fitting what's, you know, sort of pre idea you had about what qualification could look like. If they're really not qualified, they're not qualified and you shouldn't be hiring them to do a job they're not qualified for. That just is a disaster. Um, so I think you just need to be honest. Um, we really needed someone with experience in this for these reasons. You know, this is a one year grant. The person really had to get up and running immediately. And so we just weren't able to be as flexible as normally we would. Uh, there were some great things about your CV, maybe. I see that you have education here and here. Um, you know, so that's great. That, that made you impressive. But in the end, um, we just weren't able, to, weren't able to hire you. I think that's totally OK. Um, I'm just going to go to the chat for a second, because I feel like I've been ignoring the chat. Um, Uh, so thanks, Sarah. I thought aggregate data was also acceptable if you had it because it would outline what you have maybe been doing up to this point to promote EDI, even if it was informal. However, next question was good because maybe the focus is going forward as opposed to any historical analysis. Um, I think that that's probably true. It is good to say things that you have done, um, but not necessary. It's really about um, how you're going to improve what you've done because we can always improve so maybe you've got you know a starting point that you're unhappy with or you were happy with and now you understand why you need to be doing different things differently so in that way you know maybe it's okay and i don't know because i'm not on the NSERC review panel but maybe it's okay to say you know because of this um EDI statement, I've learned a lot and I see where I was going wrong and these are the things that I want to do going forward. It's a possibility. It's something to think about. Um, thank you, Dr. Willis. I certainly have a better understanding of the present status of EDI in our society and how I can try to address this in my research group and in general. That is excellent. I'm very happy about this. 
Excellent presentation. Thank you very much, Edwin. Uh, the isolation point is really critical. I experienced this even as a white male. I felt very excluded from the culture of my colleagues when I worked in the UK with a bunch of other but British white men. So I, I, can, I can guess how brutal this must be for underrepresented groups in North America. Yeah, it's, it's killer. Um, thank you for your presentation. I just used your code of conduct as you allowed in my website to hopefully help with future HQP. Just wanted to acknowledge that and thank you again for it. That's awesome. Uh, but do please modify it according to your group. Um, like use it as a discussion point for your group. Okay, Dr. Um, okay, he pronounced this last time. They pronounced it last time. El Magar, El, El Mar It's It's very simple, El Maragi. Maragi. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just uh, putting uh, political correctness aside for a little bit, uh, the challenge that we have uh, really, particularly in hiring graduate students, even hiring uh, faculty members, but certainly graduate students, uh, because in all this discussion of EDI, we're making the assumption that the unrepresented uh, uh, group are the designated groups. But in fact, we have the opposite problems. We have the minorities and visa students of various uh, that would be, um, you know, represent uh, designated groups are the applicants. We do not have enough of uh, uh, the majority uh, uh, from the Canadian students. So this is our challenge. Um, uh, and, and we are successful on and off, but it's, it's a big uh, competition and challenge to get those good Canadian undergraduate students to stay for graduate studies. Uh, so how does one become um, EDI proper as well as uh, honest about the reality of the situation? Well, I mean, so there are some areas in which we are doing, we are doing well. And, and there are some things like, so for example, uh, nursing is predominantly female and um, male nurses in the nursing program struggle with some of these same issues. They don't struggle with it in the same way because society is still, still has these inherent biases. Um, and you can see that the higher up um, in the nursing hierarchy you go, the higher the percentage of men even though the percentage of men is so much less than women in nursing. So I think it's important to be honest about what the issues are. You know, in some cases we don't have, uh, you know, access to a, a particular, so for example, in my field, I have virtually no indigenous people applying. Um, and and so so that's an issue. I can't get indigenous people into my group without them applying. Although um, now that I have my code of conduct on my website, all of a sudden I have an indigenous person applying. And because they are indigenous and I know what they go through in order to actually make it to the end of an undergraduate degree, the, I went a, a little bit above and beyond what I would normally do to hire a student. Um, for this student because I thought that it was important it was important to promote this person's career as it's give them the opportunities that they need to succeed um, so coming back to your question I think I think we need to be honest and realistic but we also need to try harder um, and maybe think a little bit outside the box about how we might be able to attract um, people does that answer your question uh, yes, yes, it does. Uh, and in that context, I, I heard that uh, U of T uh, medical faculty are now putting special programs to attract more men. Oh, okay. So, so I think one has to deal. So, so in other words, uh, in addition to the, uh, the proper job advertisement, what is really important is to train, uh, the, first of all, the committee has to be diverse to begin with, and then they have to be trained in uh, uh, unconscious bias, uh, conflict of interest, and, and uh, of course we do have a PCE committee uh, a representative on our committee, so uh, we have had this equity um, 
person on the committee for, for a long time, but not all universities might have that. Uh, and even then, uh, there is bias. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any further questions? How much of the EDI statement should focus on the institution's EDI action plan? In my personal opinion, none. Um, unless that EDI action plan is offering training, which you are going to participate in, um, the institution's EDI action plan, like I said, institutions have had EDI plans for, for a decade. Uh, and yeah, they're, now they're all coming out with more with the dimensions program. Um, but deferring that responsibility to the EDI, to the institution's action plan is not talking about what you are going to do. If you are going to take advantage of some of those opportunities that come about because of the action plan, great. But you need to talk about what you are going to do and not about what the university is going to do. Unfortunately, the University of Windsor does not have an EDI action plan. Well, uh, not yet, Lisa. Ah, okay. I, we're working on that. Okay, excellent. We do have an EDI action plan for our Canada Research Chair program, but we are working on an action plan uh, for in, the institution. One of the problems with action plans is the lack of accountability. Uh, and that's certainly what we've seen before, what we've seen in the past, and what a lot of us are concerned about going forward, especially with the Dimensions program. Um, you know, institutions are coming up with these action plans. Who is going to hold the institution accountable? Um, there's, it's really easy to, to, you know, talk the talk. It's really easy to, put out these anti-racism statements um, when, you know, something like George, George Floyd happens, um, but action uh, and accountability, actual accountability for those action plans are um, not obvious. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, that's why I say, um, do not focus on your institution's EDI action plan. Yeah, I agree entirely. I think it, it comes down to, um, the measurables and, and how do you measure is if you aren't measuring what you're what you're doing you don't know if you're improving or not exactly but all to say that we are in in the process that is uh, something that is being developed right now awesome so I just want I think that we've answered all the questions and I just want to be respectful of everybody's time um, because it is 537 now here and 337 in Alberta. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you very much, Lisa. This was a wonderful, very informative session. Um, I've, I've learned a lot more as well. Um, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, we really appreciate all your time. I hope that everybody that's participated today has uh, got some really good takeaways that will help you as well with um, crafting your EDI statements for your lab. We will be posting today's session on um, on the ORIS website and stay tuned because we will be providing some information for the um, EDI student awards that we had mentioned at the beginning. And we will also be um, sharing that information through the daily news to cast a, as wide of a net as possible. I know I've talked to um, a few folks that are very interested in this and um, I think it's great. Uh, normally, Lisa, we would have invited you to, to uh, join us in Windsor. And uh, I think this, this is a fantastic opportunity that you know, we can provide some support to some students, a couple students. So I'm really excited about that. So thank you again for your time. And um, I, we really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody. And I hope that everybody has a great evening. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Lisa. You're very welcome. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Have a good evening. You're very welcome. You too.